nice to be back in uh, Swan Lian again. It's nice to be back in Taipei. Uh, this morning as I took the HSR from Tainan down to Taipei, I never seen so many people at this time of the morning on the Sunday morning. So I guess holiday is on already. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. As a teacher, I always look forward to students asking questions. And in my teaching experience in Taiwan, this exercise does not happen most of the time. I think students in Taiwan are afraid to ask questions, lest they will be seen as foolish, or laugh at by their classmates, or sometimes they will be scolded by their teachers. <laughs> Don't you understand? So most of the people, most of the students, dare not ask questions. But asking questions is a, good, is a good exercise, because it either shows that the students are thinking about the subject or topic that the teacher is not clear about, or it tells about something about this teacher that does not explain the topic well enough. And so it needs elaboration. Often the question raised by the student leads to discussion of other issues and evokes the thinking of the class. Sometimes the question would raise the question raised would sometimes resolve by an answer, sometimes it does not resolve by an answer, but creates more questions, more concerns regarding the question raised. In our gospel reading this morning, the lawyer or the expert of the law in our scripture reading asked good questions. And not only did he ask good questions, but he also gives good answers. Many times when we read about this encounter about Jesus and the lawyer, we tend to describe the lawyer as an adversary of Jesus. But this is not so in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, he calls Jesus teacher. Teacher, a very respectful address. And Jesus engages with this lawyer as an equal. Responding to the lawyer's first question with a question. And this reminded me when a student in my class said, Dr. Tan, do you believe in the resurrection? Very good theological question. My, my answer to him is, what about you? Do you believe in the resurrection? Answer the question with a question. So the first question that the lawyer asks is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered this lawyer's question with a question. What is written in the law? What is written there? This is the rabbinical way of instruction. As someone says that to be a Jew is to ask questions. And so here we have two Jewish person, Jesus and the lawyer, asking questions to invoke thinking. 
The lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus agreed with the answer. Jesus said, Do this, and you will live. And then the lawyer posed another question in our scripture reading that he wanted to justify himself. So actually, he asked the second question not because he wanted to test Jesus, but he wanted to justify himself because he's a lawyer, he's a thinking person. One question leads to another question. And so he asked, Who is my neighbor? In which Jesus answered the question with a story. So it seems that Jesus did not take the lawyer's test as an antagonist. It is a teaching strategy. As an instructor, I always like to think about pedagogical. The way in which we teach is to invoke thinking, invoke more questions. I don't like to give my students answers. I want them to think and to find the answers for themselves. And so here we have Jesus answering the second question with a story. It was the test of the mind. It was a test of the knowledge. It was a test of the law. So Jesus did not dismiss the law or its teachers. Because in the other gospel, like in the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Luke, the question, the person who asked the question was a different question. The question asked was, what must, what is the greatest commandment? But here, the lawyer in Luke asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Responding the lawyer's questions with two questions. What is written? First, the second question is, how do you read it? How do you read it means that how are you going to interpret this text? And so the lawyer gives the right answer and Jesus says, yeah, good. Do and do and you will live. And so the mind keeps on thinking and so the second question. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor is a very important question. For the lawyer, observing the law is not just an intellectual exercise. He knows the answer. He asked the right question. He asked good question. He got the right answers. But it's not just an exercise of the mind. The purpose of the discussion is not to find definition, not to find meaning. It is not limited to the observance of the law, but rather to fulfilling what God asks of the law. And that is doing righteousness. Being a good neighbor, being a neighbor is to do righteousness. And so doing this righteousness, what does it mean for this lawyer is found in the parable of the Samaritan, whom we always loved to call him the good Samaritan. In fact, if we read the parable, the Samaritan was not called good. He was just called a Samaritan. So actually, here comes our interpretation. We put the word good because we like to see him as good. But if we read the scripture parable, you say there was just Samaritan. There was just Samaritan. And how we love the story because we can interpret the characters, we can interpret the actions, we, we like the plot, we like the twist of the parable. A parable. It's fascinating. It makes for a good story. Who is my neighbor is a genuine question of the lawyer. Were his neighbors those in physical proximity, living on the same street, or the village? Maybe we belong to the same tribe. This is my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Were his neighbors those 
in social proximity, those who belong with the same social class like he is, a lawyer just like him, or someone as intellectual as he is. Who is my neighbor? A very vague question, big question. The lawyer knows that a relationship with God extends beyond oneself. One's relationship with God extends to that of one's neighbor. Who is my neighbor? So he does not stop there. I think the lawyer also wanted to justify himself, want to know more. There's another question in the mind of the lawyer. How can I be sure that he is caring for this neighbor properly? I know my neighbor has lived down the street from the same social class, same family, same church, and so forth. But how am I going to care for this neighbor of mine? And so this parable that Jesus told to the lawyer was to invite him. To invite him to experience the meaning of this story together with the lawyer, you and I. We are not only called to have an intellectual exercise of the mind and the knowledge, asking good questions, giving good answers. In this parable, Jesus is inviting who do you identify with? Who is the neighbor? The priest? The Levite? The lawyer? The innkeeper? The Samaritan? Who do we relate ourselves in this parable? Let us imagine that we are the listeners, one of the listeners in Jesus' time, or reader in Luke's time. And listening to this parable. And we know that the hostile relationships between the Jews and the Samaritans. This morning we read in, the God, in Luke 10, but if you read even before Luke 10, in Luke 9, 51 to 55, Luke wrote that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He sent his messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to get ready, things ready for him. But the people there in the Samaritan village did not welcome him as he was heading towards Jerusalem. And so Jesus' disciples, James and John, saw this. And so they asked the Lord, why don't you call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Such was the hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. So it was very unimaginable for a Samaritan to bring a battered Jew, bandage him, give him oil, and then bring him to the inn. And also to pay for his lodging expenses, and even any additional accidental expenses. Sometimes I just wonder, what sort of inn did this battered Samaritan, battered Jew go to? Or what sort of inn did the Samaritan bring this battered Jew? Because one could imagine that the Samaritan, the Jew, if it's a Jewish innkeeper, you would never think of a Samaritan sleeping in one of his beds. If it's a Samaritan innkeeper, I don't think he will be thinking that he wants a Jew sleeping in his bed. There is this antagonism. When thinking about hotel sleeping bed, I think of myself. Last year when I went back for, for Singapore, I came back. I was trying to book my quarantine hotel in Tainan. 
Oh, there were some hotels said for Taiwanese only. Not all the hotels are available for me. Even the nice ones, I thought, I want to go to this hotel for Taiwanese only. So in the, in the end, I booked into a hotel that is open to Taiwanese and to all of us, to all the others. So there is also discrimination you know, in a culture. I, I guess in Taipei, it will be the same as well. So imagine the Samaritan and the Jew. If it's a Jewish innkeeper, I don't want the Samaritan sleeping in my bed. If it's a Samaritan, I don't want the Jew sleeping in my bed. So I got, I, I kind of think, a parable, a story, I begin to think maybe the Samaritan who brought this Jewish man must have gone to a Samaritan inn who would be accepted him and so forth. And so it might be to the horror of this battered Jew to be sleeping in the Samaritan inn. But in any case, a parable makes us think of the impossibility or the possibility. But one thing we know that this Samaritan is the neighbor. Samaritan is the neighbor. The neighbor is the other. The one most despised, the one that is most feared, the one that is not like us. Indeed, the Samaritan showed compassion, but he was a risk taker and a courageous one. We always call him a good Samaritan, but he's a risk taker. A risk taker because he never knows if his action will be fully reciprocated by the Jew, even though he was so badly battered. A risk taker. I would like to say he's a risk taker. He's a courageous. We call him a good one, but he's a risk taker. Imagine that a migrant worker you know, coming to your aid. Would you want a migrant worker to go carry you and to bring you to an inn? I think twice. The migrant worker might also think twice. If I carry this Taiwanese ping ti ren, I might get be bitten up and so forth. Risk. We have idealized this parable of good, but he's a risk taker. He's a courageous one. And so while listening to this story, we think of the antagonism between two groups of people, different ethnicity, different status. When the lawyer hear this parable, I'm wondering if the lawyer was put in the dilemma First and foremost, I don't think he wants to empathize himself with the priest or the Levite. You heard the story, the priest and the Levite. The lawyer does not belong to their class. I'm a lawyer, they are the priest, they are the Levite. Their, their functions, their roles are different from me. We have different status. The functions of the Levites and priests are recorded in Leviticus 18. For the Levites, their role are primarily in the temple. They sing psalms during temple service, they maintain the temple and perform other service, but not the lawyer. And then the priests were to officiate many offerings under the law of Moses, burnt offering, thanksgiving offering, so these two people, these two, the Levites and the priests, their roles are related to the observance and the rituals of the temple. So we wonder, theologically we are different, intellectually we are different. I'm, the lawyer say, I want to have no part to empathize with this priest or Levite. Socially we are different. But more than that, their actions were deplorable. Their actions were shocking. The lawyer does not want to have any association with them. And so, the only character that the lawyer is to associate was the Samaritan. And here comes 
the dilemma. The Samaritan was the one who gives mercy. The Samaritan is the other. But when it comes to the person who is in the ditch or the person who is in the battered situation, the otherness seizes whether that person is from a different race, different ethnicity, different social status, it seizes. When one receives life-serving mercy, common humanity is experienced. Who is my neighbour? Who is my neighbour? And the lawyer understood. The lawyer understood and so do we. Who is our neighbour? And what it looks like to be a neighbour. This is my neighbour. What is it to be a neighbour to someone? Jesus answers the lawyer's question in the twofold manner. The neighbour is the one we least expect to be a neighbour. Alongside the neighbour is the one who does righteousness, the one who does show mercy. Jesus' final words to the lawyer's question, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. And it seems to parallel that of the commandment which Jesus gave to the lawyer's first question. Do this and you will live. Similar. Do this and you will live. That was the first response to Jesus' question to the lawyer. And secondly, Jesus said, go and do likewise. Uh, go and do likewise is, a pre- is an invitation. Invitation to you and to me to preach, to care for the downtrodden and disenfranchised. The downtrodden, regardless whether there is a Samaritan, regardless whether there is a Jew, they are to be cared for. It is an invitation not only to us, but also to the innkeeper. Sometimes we read only the priest and the Levite, but also to the innkeeper. To care for those uh, in the dumps, in the ditch. But it is not only for us to care, we like to be the good Samaritan, but it is also an invitation for that person who is in the ditch, in the dumps. The person in the ditch, the battered man, the battered Jewish man, reminds us what it feels to be forgotten. He was battered. He was lying there for a long time. The Levite passed by. The priest passed by. It must be a long time lying there. The man in the ditch, the battered man, also reminds us what it means to be forgotten by others. There are other people whom we forget. And perhaps sometimes the man in the ditch is God. The Levite and the priest pass by God. The feeling of loneliness and forsakenness invites compassion, invites us to have empathy to all who experience. Take it from the other side. Take it from the side of the man who is battered. What it means to be forsaken, what it means to be downtrodden, what it means to be disenfranchised. Both sides, the Samaritan and the battered man. But in all this parable, there are so many gems, there are so many elements in which Jesus invites in this parable for us to think, who is my neighbour? The lawyer has all the good questions. The lawyer gives good answers. He went to good school. He knows what is written in the law and given the right answers. Good question, right answers. However, they need to be acted on in action. Faith without works is dead. 
in the letter of James, James tell his hearers, faith without works is dead. And so likewise, for some of us, we need to act on our understanding of our faith in Jesus Christ. We know our scriptures, we know our Lord's Prayer, we come to church, we are religious people, we have good questions, we give right answers. It is not only analytical, but it has to be practical. Go and do likewise. Let us pray. God of love gives us deep love for you so that we can see the world as you see it. Feel the compassion you feel it and be a people whose life mediate your love to others. God of love, we ask that you open our eyes that we, may, we might see what the Samaritans saw. Grant us the insight to see the needs of others and the need in others. Grant to us the wisdom to know what to do and the will to do it. And so we pray for all those who are in many and various ways have been stripped, bitten, and left for dead. We pray that we that you will open our eyes that we might not cross the road from human need. We pray that you give us a deep love for you that we might see your love at work in this world and that we might go and do likewise. In all this we pray for the sake and for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name. Name we pray. Amen.